A picture is worth a thousand words. It's the oldest adage in the book, but it's true. The quote traces back to a 1911 article in the Syracuse Post Standard, and it's credited to editor Tess Flanders. She was talking about the power of images as a journalistic tool when she said this. And while the quote's over a century old, the message is something we can all empathize with even today. Images hit us far faster and on a far deeper level than words ever could. This is Jonathan Klein. He's the co-founder of Getty Images, which is an American stock photo agency that owns over 80 million photographs in their archives. At TED 2010, he gave a talk about how photographs could change the world. And in many cases, they have. That sounds insane, right? But let me show you. So this is a photograph from the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, to most of the American public, was the first war they really saw up close. To them, it was the first war without censorship. The images from Vietnam were not vetted or scanned by any officials. And so these, as you can see, are incredibly impactful. This one's called Napalm Girl, and it shows a nine-year-old girl running after being burnt. And the next one shows a, a Viet Cong member shooting a rebel point blank. These images, amongst many others, described better than any news article ever could the savagery, the true savagery of the war, and so were instrumental in pushing the American sentiment towards peace in the zone. This picture of um, Che Guevara on his deathbed, Bolivian revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara was captured and killed by his own government along with the United States of America. But instead of dumping the body, they decided to send a message to the world. And so they circulated this image to prove that he was really dead. Well, that backfired. And this image not only spurred Shea's own revolution, but immortalized him as a symbol for all revolutions to come. This picture is from the Abu Ghraib prisons. And it was instrumental in exposing an entire country. It showed us and the American public what the government was really doing in their prisons and exposed torture and other such practices. Photographs can also remove a taboo. This picture of uh, Princess Diana holding an HIV positive child went a large way in changing the public opinion of the disease and removing a few misconceptions that existed in 20th century Europe. It can spur an anti-terrorist movement as this picture, the falling man, did after 9-11. It can end an entire industry, as this picture did for the Zeppelin industry after the Hindenburg disaster. We, what basically happened was like that Zeppelin crashed. And um, you know, it was not the first Zeppelin crash, and it was not even the biggest. But the fact that there were 22 photographers present and hundreds of images circulated of it was instrumental in making us realize how dangerous a practice it was. And it was the first step towards moving further technologically and moving to airplanes from this. And in some cases, a picture can even become representative of an entire era, like this one the migrant mother did for the Great Depression. So in the words of British war photojournalist Don McCullen, photography, photography for me is not looking, it's feeling. And each one of the images I just showed you makes us feel something, fear, pity, horror. And it had the same effect, it incited the same visceral feeling in massive audiences when it was first published and created real world impact. With photography, as with any art form, there are three stages to the experience. There's creation of the content, there's transmission, which for a large period of time was exclusive to official publications which publish these photographs, and there's the impact it causes. At TED 2010, Jonathan Klein, whom I showed you, um, focused on the third, impact. Speaking about the real world impact the photographs he displayed had had. I'm here to talk about the recent developments in creation and transmission, the first two, and how rapidly developing these two helps us, helps each one of us harness the power of the third. 
So a lot of big companies, especially non-profits like Amnesty International, have been harnessing this power effectively for centuries. I'm sorry, for decades. Apologies. Yeah, for decades. And they use jarring photographs to display to us sensitive issues that they can't convey as well in words. Um, I'm going to show you one photo series. This was Amnesty International on the issue of torture. So they printed these in their in magazines. And as you can see, this image hits you far harder than any written account of torture ever could. In the last few years in particular, the rapid growth of social media and uh, the posting of images becoming mainstream has changed the way we think of photography. As you can see, Facebook has 1.4 billion active monthly users who upload 350 million photographs every day to add to the total count of 250 billion. And Instagram has 500 million monthly active, adding 80 million a day to, uh, to add to 30 billion total photographs. The Facebook stats from last year and the Instagram stats from last month. So looking at that, that's 350 million every day on Facebook and 80 million every day on Instagram. That's 430 million photographs uploaded to just these two platforms every single day. That's 430 million chances to affect the entire world every single day. And some of those who have taken these chances have succeeded greatly. Brandon Stanton is a name all of you are familiar with. He is the founder of Humans of New York and most probably the most important photojournalist of our times. He started Humans of New York when he found himself unemployed and decided to move to New York and shoot 10,000 portraits of citizens, random citizens on the streets in an, in an effort to destigmatize the act of talking to strangers, which is an art we've lost today. And it has been hugely successful. He started posting them online in 2010, and soon they caught fire. And today he has 17 million followers on Facebook and five and a half million of them on Instagram, and has spawned several thousand replicas of his project in every major city in the world and even in smaller institutions, including this very school. But the real impact of Brandon Stanton's work is the direct contribution he's had to many of the places he's photographed. In 2012, after Hurricane Sandy hit, he went to some of the hardest hit parts of New York and photographed people such as these. And following that, to add to this, he started a fundraiser with Tumblr founder David Karp. And their goal was $100,000. In the first 12 hours itself, they hit 86,000 and ended at a whopping $319,000 towards Hurricane Sandy relief. And he repeated this. That's Vidal. Um, he was shot in Brooklyn and in a neighborhood that did not have the privilege of good schooling and the likes. And following this and following his emotional description of how his teacher was his greatest role model, Stanton started another fundraiser and raised a million and a half dollars towards the education of these children in that neighborhood in Brooklyn. In 2015, he took his efforts international. That is a picture of Sayeda Ghulam Fatima, um, the leader of the Bonded Labor Liberation Front, an organization based in Lahore, Pakistan, and who works to free bonded laborers who, due to predatory loan practices, often get no compensation for the hard work they do. One fundraiser later, whose goal was a million dollars, they hit the goal in less than 12 hours, and they ended up at two and a half million dollars towards this cause. We move on to another person, Rupi Kaur. For anyone that's been active on Instagram in the last year, her work is no new thing. So she posted to Instagram in March this picture, and it went viral. It was from her photo series period. And Instagram removed it, not once but twice, for, quote, violating the site's community standards. The photograph, which has since been viewed millions of times, attacked Instagram censorship and tackled a larger photographic issue, which is that of censorship. Because for, for decades before this, and for decades since photography has really existed as a mainstream stream of media, um, 
censorship has been a huge issue because you're not allowed to see a lot of the photographs that would make a real impact on us because they're too graphic or you know deemed inappropriate for our eyes but this picture which was taken down twice from instagram was later posted uh, on facebook in a censored form along with instagram's uh, justification for taking it down and within a day it went viral and the next day rupee received uh, an apology from instagram saying they had deleted it not once but twice by mistake and now the reaction to this has been mixed not everyone has been very progressive but it has had a deep impact because while the mindset has not entirely changed what it has done it is is started a conversation about an issue that has been hushed up for centuries behind these veils of apparent modesty and just the fact that it has started this conversation even among as she says her aggressively conservative uh, canadian punjabi family is an incredible deal so this is instagram apologizing for that and now the point of me showing you these photographs before this was to inspire you and now i'd like to show you how they inspired me so this is my story so i got my first taste of photojournalism last year i was shooting a community service project in my own school where in 11th grade students just like yourselves taught um the housekeeping staff rudimentary english and computer science in an attempt to you know make them understand their job a little bit more and make life a little easier for them and so before i shot this i was incredibly nervous because i had never shot subjects like these i didn't know how uh, well i would connect with them i didn't know whether they'd be offended by my presence there i didn't know how they would react to me at all but you know after that 90 minutes i was deeply moved not only by their own resilience and their dedication to the project itself but morely more so by their reaction to me because you know i thought it'd be negative but i was wrong they were incredibly excited to be photographed because you know for uh, the housekeeping staff in a school especially is a section of the faculty that gets ignored a lot of times right we pass them every day and never look a second time but for that 90 minutes you know in front of a camera they were the stars of their own show they 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 were the center of the attention and you know i saw how it pushed them to work even harder at the project and to to you know showcase their best side and so i was extremely excited by this experience and so i decided to found this field this is a picture from that project you can see like that smile is why we do this that smile is everything we want to capture through these photographs so this feed as the host very graciously already introduced it's a pro bono photography initiative so we offer our services to non-profits and other community service projects basically anything that's going to do good for society without charging a cost and we do it entirely free and we meet the middle ground between offering them really high quality imagery to properly be able to publicize their work on social media and not charging them anything for it we're entirely student run and we've had an amazing first year so i'd like to share with you my most memorable experience from tasveer so this these are pictures from a group meeting of the parkinson's disease the national parkinson's disease and movement disorder society I had the privilege of attending this and it was 50 elderly parkinson's patients and it was a group exercise session so I was sitting there in one corner trying to blend in and it was this incredible display of resilience in front of me because exercises that would be an afterthought to me or to you which we do like you know as a warm up before really getting to what we want to do was were so incredibly difficult for these people but the spirit in the fighting the 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 determination to rebel against their situation was so great in them and you know at the end of this meeting one of them got up and gave a very stirring speech about how they would not give up that fight at least until the next time they met and they would motivate each other 
to continue down the path to recovery or at least controlling their situation. And I was standing in that corner and I was amazed by all these people in front of me and I met this woman. So this woman, grey haired, bespectacled, completely inconspicuous. You wouldn't look at her a second time if you passed her in the road. But she is, to this day, the most inspirational woman I've ever met. So she called me and she showed me that postcard which you can see in the photograph on the right. And it's an intricate oil painting and she told me she had done it herself. And this is an 80 year old woman who has had Parkinson's for the last 25 years but has taught herself to paint to cope with her disease and to not fall victim to it. And this really more than anything else is what makes me want to do the work we're doing at the Sphere. We want to capture these stories, these stories that would otherwise go hidden. We want to chronicle them. The everyday extraordinary is what we call it. So this is uh, our first year. We're in five cities, 70 plus volunteers, 40 nonprofits served, including some really nice ones like uh, Doctors Without Borders. And uh, we worked with UNESCO through an affiliate called Nine is Mine in Delhi. And we have over 1,500 Facebook followers, which is an extremely important part of our outlook. With the Sphere, our goal is twofold. We contribute directly to our community by offering photographic services to those who need them and helping them publicize their work better and attract more donations and the likes. But we also want to create the culture of social service among the youth around us, which is why that 1,500 number is important to us. Because we want to, by showing all the teenagers, which is a large part of that demographic, the work that is going on around them, we want to inspire them to get involved and to volunteer more. And we've done that. We've had a direct, tangible impact on not only our clients, but also our volunteer photographers, who have, uh, for, who, for a lot of whom, this was their first experience with photojournalistic activities. And a lot of them have, you know, imbibe that to a degree of wanting to do that professionally. So these are a few pictures from our first year. This is a project called the Vatsalya, uh, I'm sorry, this is the Vivekananda Youth Foundation, which uh, provides education to children of underprivileged homes. A lot of them work as domestic help with us. This, these are pictures from Swachhale which is a student-run sanitation project which goes to slums in Bombay and installs toilets. That's a volunteer and that's uh, one of the members of the slum. This is a, these are pictures from the Vatsalya Foundation, which is the government project, which rehabilitates uh, a lot of children from bad areas of the city and um, helps them get jobs and turn their lives around. So I started this talk with a set of photographs and I'd like to end with another set of photographs. This one is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's a worker mining conflict minerals, which are basically minerals that contribute to the economy of whatever is causing a particular conflict. This one's from Libya. That hole in the glass is caused by a sniper bullet and the man has refused to fix that as a memory of the, the struggle his family ha had to go through. This was taken exactly a year after that bullet went through that hole. This is from Hurricane Sandy and it's a Time Magazine photograph. And so these three photographs, not unlike the first few I showed you, are extremely impactful and send a really powerful message, right? The difference is those were taken using heavy, expensive photographic equipment. These were all taken using iPhones. And the last one even made the cover of time. As smartphone cameras have progressed, um, the adoption of them as a legitimate, bona fide photographic and photojournalistic tool has become extremely widespread. And this is really important to us because each one of us has a phone, right? And so we can connect with these images on a level that we couldn't connect with all the images before this. Because any of us could have taken that image. So nothing embodies this spirit more 
then Time Magazine's Hurricane Sandy uh, coverage efforts. So, um, in 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of America, Time was in a conundrum because they didn't know how they were going to photograph this because the, the power sources and everything like that was compromised. So, they didn't know how they were going to keep a record of this and they were scared of losing a lot of the photography they took. right? And so, the solution they came up with was they gave five acclaimed photojournalists the keys to their Instagram account and told them to document everything on Instagram as it happened. And so, these photographs are directly from Instagram. And I have quotes from there, from particular photojournalists. Michael Christopher Brown said, quote, I had immediate access to hundreds of thousands of viewers. There was this tremendous sense of power, as I was both a photographer and an editor, able to reach an audience faster than any wire service. Within hours, five of these photojournalists were on ground and shot hundreds of stunning images, including this one which made the cover. This is shot by Ben Lowy. All right. At the speed, we have made a conscious effort to inculcate mobile photography into our own activities. So, they, these photos that follow are from Valwanda, which is a village two hours from Bombay. And we shot a photo essay there with an NGO called Anand Pikas, on a school trip in fact, uh, where we aimed at documenting the effects last year's droughts in Maharashtra had had on the villagers. And so, these photographs were taken there and um, they were all taken on a phone. This quote really encapsulates the entire mobile photography revolution. So, again, Michael Christopher Brown, one of the time photographers, as the Leica democratized professional looking photography, so has the camera phone. It flipped the world of professional photography onto its head because anyone with a phone can take professional looking pictures. Even a child can compete with a professional. At TED 2010, Jonathan Klein ended his talk by thanking the photographers in the audience for their contribution to society through their images. Today, six years later, I'm here to tell you that that distinction between photographer and not photographer is no longer necessary. Today, in your very own pocket, you hold the power to create incredibly impactful images and to share them with the world to create real change. So, I leave you with just one question. What are you waiting for? Fire away. Thank you.